Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to Kensington's Insight Bible Study. My name is Maria mucker -Deachin. I'm from the Clinton Township campus, and I'll be teaching on second, and, uh, second chapter and third chapter of James today. And I'm very grateful for this study and your willingness to continue to participate in our Zoom meetings. Um, I have to confess I'm not a Zoom person. I am an extrovert, so I love being with my people at my campus. And um, I just miss my ladies so much. I miss the fellowship and the breakfast and the worship and all the wonderful things. But I have to tell you something. Last semester, we had a small amount of ladies on the call, but God was so evident and it was uh, just a sweet, joyful time to be together. So we know that he can work all things, uh, even through a Zoom meeting. So let's get started and um, let's welcome the Holy Spirit. So Father, I just thank you so much for James and for Dee Dee and all of uh, the work and love that both of you have put into the study. And I'm asking you, Father, that this book of James takes deep, deep root in our hearts, Lord, in our minds, Lord, that we truly do and become doers of the word and not just hearers. And I ask this in your name. Amen. So in chapter one, there are various topics that James spoke about. And at the end of the chapter, we remember where James said um, about being doers of the word and not just hearers. And that means having a teachable spirit, being able to receive and acknowledge the conviction of the Holy Spirit and applying what we're hearing to our daily lives, living out the word of God in obedience. So being doers of the word and not just hearers. So one thing I felt about James in this study and this book was that there was such a sense of urgency in his spirit, not only just to preach the gospel of Jesus, but there was like no time but the present. And that was to go right to the heart of the matter of his people. And James wants to see transformed hearts and renewed minds of the people who say they are true followers of Jesus. And so he gives us a series of topics that would make us so uncomfortable, uh, that kind of squirming in the seat uncomfortable, those types of topics that we just do not want to talk about. Um, it's even hard to talk about it with, um, in our small group, you know, hoping that the question doesn't come to us. But James wants us to think about our behavior, think about how we react and how we respond at the matter before us. For example, in the second chapter of James and third, he emphasizes on four things, and that's partiality versus love, mercy over judgment, faith without works is dead, and taming the tongue. And this is all towards believers. So one of my favorite movies is The Wizard of Oz. And one of my favorite characters is the lion. I mean, who doesn't love the lion? And I remember a particular scene where they're on their way to take the broom from the witch. And the lion is standing at the entrance of the forest. And he's reading these signs. It says, beware, look out. I'd turn back if I were you. And he knows the seriousness of these warnings because he knows if he went forward, he would be walking right into the enemy's camp. And this is what James is doing in this book, giving us the warning signs that so we do not enter into the enemy's camp. He starts in chapter two with a serious warning of partiality. And the warning against partiality, prejudice, discrimination, favoritism. James gives us some examples of how believers show partiality towards the rich versus the poor. And he states God has chosen to use the poor who are rich in advancing the kingdom of God. And he states if we keep the royal law found in the scriptures, which is love your neighbor as you love yourself, but show partiality, and then James calls it what it is, he says we commit sin. So in verse three, he says it like this, if you show special attention to the man wearing the clothes and the rich clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand over there or you sit over here by my feet. 
Have you not discriminated amongst yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Then he goes to verse 12, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. So what he's saying to, to believers is who do not practice partiality, but who practice love and mercy towards others, then they will triumph at the time when they come before Jesus in the judgment seat. So I wanna give you an example of this. Um, I was given a book years ago, it was called Fresh Wind, Fresh Fire by Jim Simbala. And he tells a story in there about a uh, particular person that um, I think today would resonate that they would be a very difficult person to love. And so I wanna read it to you verbatim because I don't wanna miss some key points here. He says, I shall never forget Easter Sunday, 1992. That day, Roberta Langella gave her dramatic testimony. A homeless man was standing in the back of the church listening intently. So I wanna stop here a second. When I lived in New York City for a short time, I went to Brooklyn Tabernacle. And when you walk into the building, it seats about 2,000. There's a very long main aisle. So if someone stood there in the back of the church in that aisle, it's directly right where the pastor sits. And so there's no way that the pastor would not see this man entering and standing in the center of the aisle in the rear of the church. So at the end of the evening meeting, I sat down on the platform exhausted as others began to pray with those who had responded to Christ. The organist was playing quietly. I wanted to just relax. I was just starting to unwind when I looked up to see this man with shabby clothing and matted hair standing in the center aisle about four rows back and waiting for permission for me to wave him to approach me. I nodded and gave him a weak little wave of his hand. And then I thought to myself, look how this Easter Sunday is going to end. He's gonna hit me up for money. This happens often in this church. I am so tired. When he came close, I saw that he was missing two front teeth, but more striking was his odor. It was a combination of garbage, urine, alcohol, and sweat and it literally took my breath away. I've been around many street people, but this was the strongest stench I have ever encountered. I instinctively had to turn my head sideways to inhale, then look back at him while breathing out. I asked him his name. David, he said softly. Where did you sleep last night, David? He said, in an abandoned truck. An abandoned truck, how long have you been on the street? He said, six years. I've heard enough and waited to get this over quickly. I reached for the money clip in my pocket. At that moment, David put his hand in front of me and said, no, no, you don't understand. I don't want your money. I'm gonna die out there. I am going to die out there. I just want the Jesus that redhead Larry was talking about. I hesitated, then closed my eyes. I felt soiled and cheap. Me, a minister of the gospel, I simply just wanted to get rid of him. When he was crying out for the help of Christ, I had just preached about. I swallowed hard as God's love flooded my soul. David sensed the change in me and felt the freedom to move forward and he fell in my chest on my white shirt and tie. I held him close. I talked to him about Jesus' love. And these weren't just words, I truly felt them. I felt love for this pitiful young man and that smell I don't know how to explain it. It had almost made me sick. But now it became the most beautiful fragrance to me. I reveled in what had been repulsive a moment ago. The Lord seemed to say to me <clears throat> in that instance, Jim, if you and your wife 
have any value to me, if you have any purpose in my work, it has to do with this odor. This is the smell of the world I died for. This is the smell of the world I died for. After I read that story, what came to my mind, I thought, I have an imagination, and I thought, I wonder if our sins take on some kind of odor in the presence of God, in the presence of Jesus. Partiality versus love. Think about this. Do you ever look at someone, and when you look at them, you go up and down with your eyes? Or you see someone of a different color, and you're in your car, and when they come close, you hit the lock button of your vehicle? They can hear that. Or ignore people who are obese. Don't make eye contact with them. Give them a smile. Completely reject someone because they're covered in tattoos. I experienced this on uh, November 3rd, uh, the uh, elections. I was working at my precinct, and uh, we had to be there at 6 a.m., and this young girl came in at 10 o'clock, and I was working the laptop, and um, she told me that she was supposed to uh, work the laptop with me, and I said, okay. So after a half hour, um, she sat there first. Um, when she sat down, she had a sleeveless top on, and she was covered in tattoos, like completely covered all her neck, her hand. She had, um, you know, nose ring and different piercings and stuff. And after a half hour, she said to me, um, thank you for being nice to me. And I said, I don't, know she, I don't know what you mean. And she goes, well, I wasn't supposed to be assigned to this precinct. I had to be transferred from another precinct because the ladies there were so mean to me. And I said, what did, they, what did they do to you, honey? And she said, well, this, this is so important. She said, you know when somebody looks at you and you just know they don't like you? And in that moment, I knew that. And from that point, they were just rude and mean. And she goes, I couldn't take it anymore. And I had to be transferred. I said, I am so, so sorry they did that to you. You know, the, the uh, word of God says that God's eye is always on us and his ears always hears us. And so as we continued to work at the precincts within that hour, every 10 minutes, someone would look at her and say, that's a beautiful tattoo there. Or someone would say, oh, that blouse is so pretty. It goes so pretty with your eyes. And it was like every 10 minutes, someone was giving her a compliment. And I said to her, do you know what God is doing? I said, God is loving you. I said, he's sad that they said those things to you, but he is showing you through these compliments that he loves you. And she just gave a sweet smile. Doesn't this discrimination, this partiality, that James is speaking about expose our beliefs. If we do any of these things now or in the past, where did these belief systems come from? Dr. Carolyn Leaf said this, often what we react to in others is an indicator of what we need to acknowledge and work on in ourselves. This is a sign that there is something we need to acknowledge, we need to own it, we need to take it to Jesus, hand it over to him for healing. Sit alone with Jesus and ask him, when and where did this partiality start in my life? Lord, what is the root of this? And I guarantee you, he will show you. Look at Jesus. All through the scriptures, over and over and over, the one attribute of Jesus that is shown over and over is impartiality. In Romans 2, it says, for there is no respect of persons with God. Jesus was always drawn to the person who was rejected, alone, oppressed, or outcasted by society. And he's attracted to sinners like you and me. And he was and still is drawn to sinners. 
we're opposite. We tend to put everyone in some kind of stratified category, upper or lower class, rich or poor, high or lower, east side, west side, their looks, their wardrobe, the house they live in, race, social status, outward characteristics, or there is just something about them that we don't like. I just don't know what it is. It's just something about them. We don't like to admit it, but in the body of Christ, we tend to be, because of our humanness, because of our fallenness, we can be very partial to certain people in our circles at church. We can be impressed with their reputation. God's not impressed with any of that. It's utterly of no consequence to him whatsoever in the matter of evaluating the worth of a soul. They're non-issues with him. God judges and God evaluates and God estimates your worth and my worth and the worth of everyone purely on the basis of our interior life of the inner person, what's going on in our heart and what kind of thoughts we're having. To put it simply, as God says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God is not disinterested in you because you're poor or because you don't look so good or because you don't have many clothes or a fancy house or a job or a reputation or degree or any of the things. He's not disinterested in you because of what you lack, nor is he interested in you by what you possess. And frankly, we who belong to God and say we are the children of God should certainly be manifesting these same characteristics. So clearly from just these particular passages, we are made very much aware of the fact that God does not respect persons, nor are we his children, to have respective persons. So let's go back to James and his intent here to be in our face about partiality, about this topic. What he's basically trying to do is test us here. The whole book of James is, James is like a litmus test on living out our faith in Jesus, being doers of the word of God instead of just hearers. So James wants you to examine yourself, to see if you're the real deal. He wants you to examine yourself to see if you're genuinely saved, redeemed, born again, if the life of God really beats in your heart. Because in the next chapter, he says, faith without works is dead. He says, what does it profit my brother if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? And what does James say next? He goes back to the example of the poor. Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it's not accompanied by action, is dead. So in these verses, James is saying, faith without works, versus faith accompanied by works. Genuine faith will naturally produce good works. It, the two complement each other. Your faith and love in Jesus will demonstrate itself in love for others. This type of demonstration of faith and works is supposed to be happening every day in our life. Is this happening? How are we expressing this in our lives? So what do we do with this? This is a hard teaching. How do we become these doers of the word of obedience and not just hearers of the word? It's a choice. It's a choice of what lens you choose to look through. It's a choice. So you're either going to look through the lens of Jesus. So let's just say these are Jesus's lens, which is love, compassion, love, more love, mercy over judgment, love, love your neighbor as yourself, more love, compassion, Jesus's lens. Or we can choose to look through the enemy's lens, condemnation, judgment, criticalness, fault finding, prejudice, discrimination, 
pride, arrogance, race, hate. How are you looking when you get up in the morning? Which one are you choosing? You look at your husband through these or these? Your kids? Teachers, neighbors, which lens? Love your neighbor as you love yourself. This is what James is saying. The word of God transforms the mind and the heart. It renews it. And as you seek God in his word, you have an increase of the Holy Spirit. It's power in your life. You have his power in your life. The more you spend time with Jesus, the more he will increase and increase in your life. And the partiality will continue to decrease and decrease and you'll become more and more like Jesus. And those partiality thoughts and wrong motives will become less and less and less in your life. We saw this manifest in the story of Zacchaeus, the tax collector. Here's Zacchaeus, he's outcasted by society He's a rich tax collector. He hears Jesus is coming into town and he want, he's very short in stature, so he wants to get ahead. So he runs and he climbs up a sycamore tree and he's laying on the branch. And as I said, I have an imagination. A lot of times I put myself in those times of Jesus and I just thought, here Zacchaeus is up in the tree. He sees Jesus from a distance. I wonder at what point Jesus locked eyes with Zacchaeus because Jesus knows he was waiting for him. And as soon as he comes to Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus comes down and the word says that he was so joyful that Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down, I'm gonna have dinner with you. He was so joyful that in the presence of Jesus, he just starts to repent. And he says, I'm giving half of what I have to the poor. And he says, and whoever I cheated, I will give back four times. And he says he was so full of joy and Jesus says, today salvation has come to this house. And they had this wonderful encounter. But the people around him, the partiality people, there's a couple translations that said they were indignant and grumbling. Indignant and grumbling and said, why is he going to have dinner with this crook with this man. You have to choose what lens you're willing to look through. And it's going to take some work. Be in community, have accountability, and when those triggers go off, you run to the cross, you run to Jesus, and you sit with him. And he will show you our shortcomings. He's very good at doing that. And Jesus said, before he left this world, he said, I'm not going to leave you as an orphan. I'm going to send you a helper, a counselor, the Holy Spirit. Sit with Jesus, bring it to the cross, and repent of it. Say, yes, Jesus, bring to mind all the times that I have been impartial to somebody, Lord. And say, yes, Lord, I did do this. And repent it out loud. And then when you're done, you renounce it. And renouncing is, I'm not going to have anything to do with this anymore in my life. Choose to look through the right lens. And you know what's going to happen? You'll choose love over partiality. You'll choose mercy over judgment. Faith will be accompanied by your love for Jesus and produce the work for his kingdom. And you'll become a peacemaker. You will now know how to tame the tongue being slow to speak and slow to anger. You'll have the control to pause for as long as it takes when those triggers come. You'll put on the right lens and not react out of emotions because the wisdom that is from above will be poured over you from your Father in heaven. And so listen to this last verse in James 3.17. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruit, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace.
You can be victorious in this. James is a tough cookie, but praise God he has put this one in our face. And yes, this is a warning, a be aware, I'd turn back if I were you kind of teaching. So we turn back and we run to the one that is waiting to help us, our precious Jesus, Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for James, for this book, for this chapter, Lord. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. And I ask you, Lord God, that you will show each and every one of us that we will have the strength and the perseverance and endurance to sit alone with you and ask you to show us in the past, in the present, where we've been impartial, Lord. And we bring it to you, Jesus. We bring it to the cross for healing. We thank you for dying for us. And we thank you for forgiving us, Lord God. And we know with you, Jesus, nothing is impossible. And we know through the power of your Holy Spirit, we'll be victorious in this area. In Jesus' name we pray.